Welcome everybody to Zootown Podcast, and I am here with Peter Hyatt. Is that how you say your name? Yep, I sh- that's I sh- it. I should have looked that up, but Hyatt. Uh, we're close friends. I don't know his last name, um, but he... I, I own all the hotels. <laughs> so he will be making but... a large donation to Zootown Church after yeah. this. Uh, yeah, they spelled my name wrong on the yeah. roof. But. <laughs> and he is the pastor now of the Sanctuary Church in uh, Golden, Colorado. That's correct, right? In in Denver. Denver. In Denver. Denver, yeah, Colorado. Yeah, so the Sanctuary of Denver. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, we brought him on because he's got a really interesting journey, um, and it's kind of very, very similar to the journey we've been on at Zootown Church in the last three years, and myself um, personally, and I've I've heard... Heard you on a few other podcasts, and um, we don't want to promote their podcast. We want to promote ours. So, <laughs> but I love so right off the bat, um, I love what you have on your website, and I'd love for you to break this down. You say, in a nutshell, or a human shell, the gospel is God is salvation. In the language of Scripture, God is salvation forms a name Yeshua that in English is pronounced Jesus, and that's the good news. That's the gospel. Is it rare? Well, no. And yes, most of us put our faith in me is salvation rather than God is salvation, or as I like to say, Mises instead of Jesus. And so, of course, then we don't really believe that God desires to save all or has the power to save all because we've come to believe that God is basically me. But the gospel isn't Mises, my choice. The gospel is Jesus, God's choice for me break that down because and Mises that comes from the Muppets uh, I don't know if you knew that but uh does it come from the Muppets I didn't know that. <laughs> but yeah um why why would you I mean you know most church websites have we believe this we believe that this scripture that scripture uh what what why did you decide to put that on your website oh gosh that's a big question um but uh I guess it was kind of the surprise that the most offensive thing I've preached over the years, and I, I preach right into controversial stuff, mm-hmm. was uh, it, it didn't have to do with sexuality, abortion, or anything like that. It had to do with uh, God's grace. And, you know, I'd read a lot of quotes that God's grace was offensive, but not until I really – but but I think what we do is we talk about God's grace. We go to great conferences, retreat centers. But everybody hangs on to this secret. Um, that I call it Satan's big butt. Yeah, that's yeah. all true. But, all the great stuff. Yeah. But God like secretly tortures most of humanity, which is like that's a that's a bit of that's a that is definitely a, a big butt. And if you preach that God is the savior of everyone, um, that well, that implies that you are that no one is the savior of themselves and. That is incredibly offensive to human flesh, is what I discovered. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, as I started bumping into that, I, you know, re- I, I was kind of cornered by a situation. I felt God was forcing me out of the closet. But as that was happening, I began to realize, oh, this is something, Lord, you want me to talk about because people are offended by you and the thing that is offended is the flesh and the flesh is the very thing that traps us in outer darkness. Um, and what traps people in what I think scripture calls Hades. So the irony is that I think so many people that say, Lord, Lord, uh, Jesus said, well, you know, you're, you're going to be in outer darkness where people weep and gnash their teeth, which is such a a strange irony because you, you, you know, I'm preaching that ultimately God redeems all people, but the sad part is so much of the church, so much of the people that name the name of Jesus don't like that fact. And I think that's because they're worshiping Mises. So when I begin to worship Jesus, Mises gets crucified. And um, that, that's, that's painful news, but it's wonderful news because all of, my, all of my problems, my depression, my fear, my sorrow, anxiety they can all be traced back to my addiction to Mises, uh, <laughs> my, my flesh, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm worried about, I'm worried about me. So, um, yeah. So yeah, from, from that, I, I really think from that one statement that I'm saved by Jesus and not Mises kind of everything else grows, grows out of that because Jesus 
which is God is salvation, is the word of God and the judgment of God that creates everything. So with my worship of Mises, I think I create what Paul calls a false self and what Jesus really called a child of the evil one, of the devil. And yet with uh, by worshiping Jesus, I, I crucify Mises and Jesus begins to live his life in me, which I think is a process that every child of Adam has to go through. But the sooner you go through it, the sooner you get to go home or you, you you are liberated from the very thing that keeps you in bondage and begin to live free. Yeah. And the, so, and that was, again, I want you to talk the most here, but that was huge for me when I studied even what the word righteousness means, you know, like yeah, yeah, we have, yeah. we've made that just about a moral standard, um, that God's way, way, way out there and he's holy set apart, which of course he's holy, of course, you know, of course. Um, yeah. But righteousness is talking about the saving God, the God who saves. <laughs> yeah. So th it's funny how in Greek righteousness and justice and vengeance and retribution, they're all one word. One group. word, yeah. And yeah, and the righteousness is defined by who Jesus is and the holy of, the thing that happens in the holy of holies is forgiveness. So the whole idea that, you know, God can't, God uh, can't, can't look on sin. It, it's so, it, it's, it's funny because he, he looks on us and Psalm 22, he, Jesus says, you know, why have you forsaken me? And the Psalm goes on to say, but you haven't forsaken you've never me. Left You're me. right here with me. Yeah. You've never left me. So, well, even Habakkuk, yeah, is, you know, that verse, he can't look on sin. Then it goes, so why do you? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Right that's after exactly that. what that's, yeah, that's what Brad Jerzak says a lot. That is so good. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, and I had a, there's a pastor here in town who, uh, not my biggest fan. Um, and he actually, yeah, he's called me a heretic from stage. And um, I actually talked to him once on the phone after that. And I reached out and he, he was, it was so funny because he was saying, well, God can't look on sin. And he was kind of testing me to know where that's at. And I was like, so I go read that passage to me. And it yeah. was in Habakkuk. And he said, like, basically, there it is. And right after that, I said, read the next verse. I go, read uh -huh. the next verse. And he didn't read it out loud. And he goes, do you even believe in the Bible? <laughs> that was his comeback. Yeah. And I was like, uh, yeah, I just shared that with you, you know, uh, in Habakkuk. Yeah. So That's a, isn't that the shock? Yeah. It's just really weird. Well, so first, let's just talk about your journey. Uh, you just tell me about where you came from, like as a preacher and, and, you know, you just mentioned that God was basically commanding you out of that. Um, and what were the, what's the hardships of that obviously, and what's been the liberation of that? Yeah. Wow. Um, that, that's really long. So I, that's okay. Okay. So you can edit this if you need to. Right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, you know, I grew up in a, my dad was a pastor. He's a Presbyterian pastor, went to Princeton Seminary um, and was part of the mainline uh, Presbyterian church. But when I was in high school, he kind of went through something of a personal renaissance and became much more evangelical in his preaching, preaching from scripture. And the church, the, the mainline church, some people in the church got offended and basically uh, kicked him out. So they kicked him out from the left for being too far to the right. And he joined the evangelical Presbyterian church. So, um, it was about that time I started feeling like God was calling me into the ministry. I was studying geology at the university of Colorado. So, um, I, I went on to Fuller seminary and, uh, dad helped start the evangelical Presbyterian church. And then when I came back from California to Colorado, I, I was part of the evangelical Presbyterian church. And I was wanting to preach from scripture, but the more I preached from script, the church, church was growing like crazy. And I was kind of the evangelical golden boy in Denver for a while. <laughs> um, but, but as I, isn't as that I'm fun? Preaching, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was fun while it lasted. No pressure but, you to know, that. <laughs> but like you said, Scott, yeah, it was kind of scary. Cause you're, you're kind of like, you know, people would say, I remember people coming up to me and saying, well, you must be doing something right. Just look at all these people. And I thought, huh, because that means uh, Hitler was doing something right. And, yeah. and Jesus Genghis was doing Khan something was wrong. Doing something right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Jesus was doing something wrong. But anyway, the more I preached through, uh, well, as I preached through scripture, um, 
I kept coming upon these verses that I thought I, I don't I really don't know how to reconcile this. And and I had always struggled with the idea that God would endlessly torture his own children because my dad was a great dad and I just couldn't picture dad, you know, dad was not into torture. He was into discipline. So if I farted around, I had to mow the lawn, you know, and do it right. And but he he never had any interest in in torturing me. So I'd always struggle with that. But then I would come across these verses like you know, as an Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. And Romans eleven thirty two, God consigned all the disobedience and may have mercy on all. And I found that I just couldn't, I couldn't exegete those verses away. I'd use all my biblical tools, and I'm like, I don't know how to undo this verse. And why would you but want to, right? Like, why would you yeah, want to and, make and that I'm something think, that's not? And yeah, and I'm going, and why are people so intent on undoing this verse? And then the more I preach, preaching through Romans and the Revelation. I kept coming across the verses. I, I, I walk into the verses that were th supposedly the ones that uh, backed up the idea of endless conscious torment, and they would dissolve in front of me when I would begin to exegete them. And what do you um, mean by that? Well, I mean, I would look at a, I would look up, I would look up Greek words like, well, what does Scripture mean by Gehenna? What does Scripture mean by Hades? And uh, what does Scripture mean by Ionios and Ion? And that's something that's you know kind of debated in our camp. But I was also a, a geology major, and so I had a science background. So the whole idea of space and time was fascinating to me. And when I began to realize, wait a minute, the way we view time in uh, Western in in our modern Western civilization is historically an anomaly, and now it's being undone by quantum physics and uh, um, Einstein's theories of relativity. And mm -hmm. if I take all that back to scripture, oh gosh, all, all these all these terrifying verses, they they're filled with hope. So, and and when I remember that God is a creator, He can turn things to dust, and well, He made us from dust in the first place. So mm -hmm. that's not the end of the story. So all of those things started fitting together, and I I realized I couldn't. I couldn't explain away the inclusive passages with the exclusive passages, but the exclusive passages just dissolved once I began to look at them. And so I began to preach these things more. At the same time, um, we were praying with a friend that was raised in a satanic coven, and I just saw Jesus do the coolest things. And what amazed me was he was always the same. He was always good. So we could call for like the fire to f come fill a room. And it would be like it would torment what was evil, and yet it would comfort us. And then I go back to scripture, and I'm preaching through the Revelation. I go to the the, the you know the the sea of fire and brimstone. You look up the word brimstone; it's the word theon, which yep. means divinity. All these wonderful things start coming together. And I'm thinking this is such good news. I couldn't I couldn't help but preach it. So well, and brimstone. Um, is a healing agent in the Middle East. Yeah. Like it's a, it's almost like a sage type healing thing, not just a, yeah. a bad thing. Yeah. There are all these cool allusions yeah. to brimstone in that society. So anyway, I'm preaching this stuff and some people in church said, and, and, I, and people really loved it. They, they thought this is so beautiful. They were so excited about God, but about five years into it, some People complained to the denomination and some guys from the denomination, you know, guys that I had known since I was a kid. So I wasn't real in awe or anything. And my dad was a pastor and they, they would say, Peter, you can't you can't say this stuff. And I'd say, what stuff? And they'd go, you know, this stuff. And I didn't know this <laughs> stuff because because I was I was real careful, Scott. I mean, I I would just quote Bible verses and then explain them away. And, and they couldn't say, well, you can't you know, you can't read the Bible to your congregation. So they they made me um, state my objections to the Westminster Confession of Faith. And, and, and I should also mention during this time, it forced me then to go back and re-examine theology. So I would go back and look at guys like Bart, and then I began to discover early church fathers said mm -hmm. this stuff. So anyway, they put me on trial, and they I had two exceptions to the Westminster Confession of Faith that um, they they said they wouldn't accept. Um, one was there's a statement about God um, damning the rest of mankind or something or was pleased to damn the rest yeah, of mankind. Yeah. And I said, I said, I, I think the word please is just the wrong word to use. And and then they said there's a group of people that cannot be saved. And I said, well, the disciples asked Jesus, who then can be saved? And they said, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So how can you make me say this? And 
they didn't have answers, but they put me on trial and they, um, ex they excommunicated me. Mm. Um, and the church that I was at had grown from a little church to several thousand. And there were some people that were in positions of power and they wouldn't let me come back to say goodbye. And it was just, it was, it was just crazy. But I went from being kind of that evangelical golden boy to the devil like overnight oh i mean it was gosh. just That's so utterly familiar. shocking so familiar and and what was so bizarre for me is i i'm thinking but i didn't change one thing i said and it was really a nightmare for the people in the church because they had a hard time believing what was going on but the people in authority uh did that but now that so that that was crazy but what's really wild is how god works in all of this so um Years before, I had gone to this conference where God literally pinned me to the floor. I, I mean, I'm Presbyterian, so it's not like I'm, you know, running off with the charismatics <laughs> all the time or anything. But he literally pinned me to the floor. Well, well before he did that, he, I, I heard him audibly say to me, Peter, you don't love my bride very much, do you? And like instantly i knew that i had gone to the ministry because i hated the church because of what the church had done to my dad i mean our heart is that deceptive you know mm. and if you would have known me at the time you would have thought well he's a great pastor really loves his people but i realized that i had kind of gone on the ministry to try to fix the church because of what they had done to my dad and i thought that the the evangelical side of the church would save me from the liberal side of of the church um and then uh later that that very same day, God pinned me to the floor and revealed to me that he had been everywhere in my life uh, working and shaping me in his image and calling me into the pastor. pastorate. Well, that, that had happened years before my church blew up. But when my church blew up, it blew up um, in kind of the same way that my dad's church blew up when I was in college. Because when my... When my um, well, I didn't say that, did I? My dad was in the mainline church, and he, well, I said he was removed yeah. by, and uh, I remember going to this meeting in downtown Denver, and I um, was so angry. I almost punched out an elder on the floor of the presbytery. I was in college, <laughs> and, well, anyway, when, when, when that is Calvinist. God re <laughs> yeah, when God revealed to me that I got into the ministry because I hated the, hated the church. Sorry, this, this story is getting too confusing. No, it's good. Um, yeah, he he re, he showed me that I had like taken a vow in that church building that I was going to fix the church. Well, when my church blew up, um, one of the people on our staff said, "Hey, can we start another church?" And I said, "Yeah, but I'm not going to start it close to the old one because everybody's going to blame me for that one anyway." So we went to downtown Denver. We we had been in Golden, then then we went to downtown okay, Denver. Okay. So we got this. We rented this building in this old mainline Presbyterian church, because now I'm in the evangelical, I had been in the evangelical church. We we signed, we made the deal, everything, and I called my mom. I said, Mom, we're going to be in Central Presbyterian Church in downtown Denver. And she said, Peter, don't you know what that place is? And I said, no, what are you talking about? She said, that's the room where you saw your dad try it on the floor of the Denver Presbyterian. So I'm saying all that because I, my dad got kicked out from the left by the right. I got kicked out from the right by the left. And God took me back to the very place where I saw my dad tried 15 years before and had me stand in the spot and preach the gospel. By this time, my dad is, had died. In fact, my wife had a wild vision of my dad right before all of this, all of this happened. All that to say, um, God's been in charge of the whole thing. And all along, I felt like he was saying, Peter, um, I'm doing things in you that are good, that need to happen. I need to transform you into the person that I want you to be. So you're not a victim. I'm in charge of this whole thing. And at the same time, he was saying, but I want you to speak something to my church because I love my church. But my church is, I think that the church has, um, well, the church is, sold out to idolatry and worship Mises instead of Jesus. So she worships herself rather than, rather than the Lord. So, and theology, see, it, it worships theology over yeah. Christ in many ways. Yeah. Over the, over the, yeah. And it's, and the, the funny thing is when it worships theology, it's just bad theology. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's not, you know, it's not, well, it's always other people's it, theology. 
like yeah. not theirs. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, that that was a long, confusing answer to your question. No, I'm but thankful. It's such a huge question, and um, I could, I guess, I could talk about it forever. So, what were some of the things? Because again, this is so very similar. Like, what were some of the things they were saying? Because what people kept saying to me is, "This is dangerous. This is dangerous. This is dangerous." And I never understood. I get what they were saying. They were saying, if you talk about this, people won't care about sin. Yeah. Um, they, you know, they'll just guess they're going to walk right in. And I haven't found that to be the case, to be honest with you. Like people who have embraced this message, like myself, I confess more than I ever have before because I see how amazingly good God is. And yeah, I have never talked to someone who um, went this way, who said, you know what? I'm just going to do whatever I want now. I'm just going to sin and I'm just going to do whatever I want. I, have you ever heard that? Like, no, no, but I, but I have heard this and I think this is, this is true. I think if you want to build an institution, this is not the best way to do it. So if, if you tell a group of people, look, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. If you just do X, Y, and Z, you're good with God and, and you're in, well, you can get a whole lot of people to join your institution, but those people won't necessarily like God. In fact, they'll, they probably secretly hate God. They're just trying to appease God and they'll show up on Sunday and, and they'll give money. <laughs> but, but I think if you, if you preach the good news to people, it, it does liberate people. And I don't, you know, I think sometimes that people feel like, well, I don't, I don't know if I want to go to a church as much. Um, but they, they may love God more and I, I hope they worship him more. So I, I under, I understand why, the institution is scared of the message. Um, and I, 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 I think people fall in love with Jesus because of the message. And I mean, the crazy thing in my experience is that, and people give and God provides. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I think that, I think people are afraid not to be afraid. And so uh, under the surface, we hold, we like the whole loving Jesus forgiveness thing, but we hang on to fear as like a backstop or, um, like just in case. Yeah. Yeah. That that's the, that's the insurance. And the irony is you can't help people believe that Jesus is salvation. And at the same time, make them fear that he's not. And, and that's <laughs> yeah. what I think we've, tried to do like he's salvation as long as and then you know fill in the blank so well, so yeah, you think I, that comes one mm -hmm. i could be wrong but to me that comes from penal substitution because there's always a god behind jesus's back and yeah that's where you know i mean it's like how do you trust that god who had to create little peons to have a because he had needed to have, express his anger over them like i always wondered from yeah. that view why wouldn't you express your anger at a star and <laughs> blow up a few stars <laughs> instead of right. tor uh, torture people you know well yeah and it also kind of um it testifies that god isn't really god right because if god is beholden to some abstract concept called justice that mm -hmm. he has to own up to well then he he isn't all powerful he's he owes something to this God named justice. That's not himself. And somehow, yeah. So it, it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And so I guess we didn't even tell our audience that, um, that led you into universalism, basically ultimate reconciliation, whatever you want to yeah, call it. Yeah. Um, and so how would you define that? Cause there's so many, everyone wants to, everyone wants to define something so they can control it or put it in a tribe, you know, or whatever, but how would you, right, right. how would you define your view of that? Well, I'd start just with the statement with the word Jesus and God is salvation, period. That's basically the whole thing. Because that's what Jesus um, means in Hebrew, right? Yeah, yes, the, name, the name Jesus means God is salvation or God saves. And I guess I'm saying he's successful. And as long as you run away from him, well, you're going to run into the darkness because he's the light. You're going to run into lies because he's the truth. You're going to run into lostness because... He's the way. And, you know, you go, well, explain more about that. I go, well, his salvation is revealed on the cross, which I think is this amazing picture of the trees in the garden. And uh, 
the truth is that you are God's creation. As long as you um, pretend to be your own creation, your own savior, well, you will not be able to exist in the presence of God because he's the truth that undoes the lie that you think you are. Yeah, you are God. Yeah. And, yeah, and so salvation really is just being okay with your own creation. And, you know, it's interesting now, all these weird stories people have of near-death experiences. And it's fascinating listening to how some people will find themselves in like an outer darkness of their own creation. And they'll talk about, you know, I always was biting other people and here I am in this place where they're biting me, or I had oh, isolated yeah. myself on the darkness and here I am in this place of darkness. And then of course, in these stories, they always then have an encounter with Jesus or the light or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And 23 minutes and in then, hell, right? That, yeah. Right. Guys. Right. So yeah. I go, but you, you, he came and got you. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to make too much out of everybody's experience, but, um, I would go, yeah, he, Jesus is saving us from our sins. And my, my sin is the assumption that I am my own creator, my own savior, my own redeemer. And that's not just like a psych psychological reality, but in to some measure, God allows us to create our own reality. And the reality that we all create in our own selfishness is really Hades or what some people call hell. And the reality that burns that reality away is the presence of God who is love and you experience him as a fire. But w once you surrender to the fire, you become a vessel of fire. You walk around the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego and, and Jesus. Mm, that's good. So 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 that so there that's the, that's the start. I, I, let me spin it out a little bit more because I think, you know, I I was a Calvinist. That's the system I grew up in. And I really like this system, except for the the middle finger of five point calvinism which is limited atonement so if if you know theology in the the five points of calvinism seem really biblical except for one and that's that jesus only died for some of the world and once you make that point biblical um you end up at what some people would call universalism the word universalism is problematic though because some people think it means that jesus doesn't matter the way I understand it, I go, no, Jesus is kind of like the only thing that matters. Oh, yeah. He's, he's the logic. He's the meaning behind all reality. So if you, if you're not okay with Jesus, you're not okay with reality, which leaves you in the middle of nowhere and nothing, which is truth. Like the word truth in Greek is reality. Yeah. It's like the same word. So that's what I always like to say is like you believing in Jesus, like we were taught accepting him into your heart doesn't make something true. It's already true. Yeah, you just accept something that's already happened and already true. <laughs> so yeah. if you don't, yeah. if you don't believe in Jesus, you're just you're not living in reality, and then you can't live who you are actually meant to be in Christ, right? So that's how I've yeah. always kind of viewed those passages. Then, so well, I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, um, and that he's the he's the logic or the logos of God. Um, it, it, when then there's this theme that runs throughout Scripture. You, if, pe if people haven't notice it look for it and that is that salvation is really waking up yeah. and um there are these fascinating verses in the old testament i i think we're well i think i think the word is tartama or something like that anyway i have my bible software i can look it up but <laughs> um that you know god puts adam in a deep sleep and it, it's interesting that i don't know that adam wakes up until jesus wakes him up in the new testament so um but that just you know, there's just some fascinating themes that run through scripture that I think we we've, we've ignored. And one of them is is that it, it, salvation is simply coming to terms with your creator and being OK with being created, which means absolutely everything is grace. The notion that anything is not grace is on the face of it absurd if, in fact, we are created from nothing. Well, and Cause I, we, we just, we don't, we don't bring anything to the table. Right. Well, and so one thing I want you to break down because you did, you know, you mentioned a, your Cal, your, you were a Calvinist and I've also heard you say some really nice things about Calvinism too, which our friend Baxter Kruger, he always laughs, you know, he says Calvinism is actually universalism. It just has less people. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I always well, that's say, exactly right. And he always kind of laughed at that. Cause he's like, they just can't take that jump. Um, Mm -hmm. Because, and again, talk about, you know, limited atonement and all that, you'd kind of break that down, but that that's instantly a dividing wedge, a pharisaical dividing wedge that there's people in and there's people out. And of course, we're the ones in. And in my journey, here's one of the things that like really 
got me because you you're right it's grace and grace alone but the calvinists preach grace and grace alone it's all grace but then they put all these burdens on you to prove that you're receiving god's grace like if, right. if you open the john macarthur study bible on one of the front pages it says here's how you know if you're saved i'm not even kidding and it's like step one, these scriptures. And if if you're obeying those ones, then you go to step two. And I remember that was a wake up call for me to be like, this is, he's not preaching grace. He is not preaching yeah. grace and grace alone. It's a shield to say, whatever I say to you after this, just know I'm all about grace. And it's like, that's not, that's not grace. So that was a big one for me. But because I was a Calvinist for a few years, and then I just realized I was just an arrogant jerk because I just thought I was chosen and all kinds of stuff. And I'm not yeah. saying I'm not saying that's everyone's reality. I know actually a ton of I still read tons of Keller and some of those guys, but um, that was my reality. So I do see certain good things in Calvinism and Tulip, and so break that down for me because you just said the L's the middle finger in it. So break that down. Yeah, yeah. So I always tell people, look, I'm a yeah, what did I, I made a little video called F-bomb Calvinism or something like that, I think. <laughs> but I, but I, the people say it differently, and it wasn't Calvin that formulated this. It yeah. was some of his followers. But the first one is total depravity, which just means you can't save yourself. Um, and then uh, unmerited favor, which is, is grace. So the thing that saves you is grace. That's the T and the U. And then I tell them, uh, it's this middle finger. This is the problem with <laughs> limited atonement, which means that Jesus only died for some. And then the next one is irresistible grace, I, th I think, or, uh, yeah. The, um, yeah. And then the last one is what the preservation of the saints or the perseverance of the saints or something like that. All, f all of those are, are really easy to find biblical, except biblically, except for that one, that middle finger. And once you take that out limited atonement, it's, it's just saying that, look, God, uh, is God created you and God is saving you and he does it in Jesus and by his grace, by this story of grace, God creates faith. And faith is not something you yourself create. Faith is a gift of, of God. So um, that's the last step in grace. So that even your faith in grace is ultimately a gift. A gift and, yeah. You know, when you exposit Paul real carefully, it's like obvious that's, that's what he's saying. So um, it, it's, it's really a beautiful thought. But then the... I mean, I really, I, I wrestled for a while with, where did they come up with this limited atonement thing? Because yeah. I just, there are all these Bible verses that say Jesus died for the whole world, not just our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And reading systematic theology, the only thing I could really come up with was theologians basically saying with a whole bunch of really big words, well, unless he, um, if he only died, if he died for everyone, then everyone will be saved. And we can't have we can't that. Have so that. Yeah. He, he couldn't have died. He couldn't have died for everyone. And that, that's you know it, guys like Karl Barth and Torrance those guys they're Calvinists that just did away with limited atonement so when people say oh this is so hard to understand I get frustrated because I'm like no it's just incredibly easy it's the easiest understand. thing to understand yeah, yeah. Uh, God is a dad that's into saving his kids and he's successful and he leaves what the is... 99 for the one <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 he and he Jesus came to seek and to save the lost and um and hey, he 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 pulls it off. That's what we believe in. And God can God God knows that because God's not bound by space and time. He he's writing the whole he's writing the whole story. And then of course, you know, people freak out about free will, but we have distorted notions of, of free will. So yeah, I, I like um, David Bentley Hart's kind of free will thoughts on that because yeah, it's like are you David Bentley Hart? Are you ever really free to make a decision? Because you have so many yeah. other factors coming in cultural all kinds of stuff i appreciate his view but to go back on something you said was in my study you asked like where that came from is uh, a lot of people don't know this but augustine left the church for nine years and he went and hung out with the gnostics he was trained under the gnostics and when you read some of the gnostic writings they believed in predestination that they were the chosen ones who got this knowledge and then other people were not and Jesus died. So that actually came from the Gnostics. Um, even the, from what I can see in their view of justice, they kind of viewed God as a yin and yang. Like he had to yeah. balance himself out. So if right. even though he's love, he had to be just as much just 
to balance himself out. And that's, again, you're, like you said, you're putting limits onto God, how he has to be, yeah. but that's yeah. what's taught now, right? Like, well, he's also, every time we talk about universalism, it's, well, he's also just, and I'm like, well, yeah, he's man- Manichaean, he's Manichaean, right? Yeah. That's yeah. What Augustine was. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was like, yeah, and that, he's, that yeah, all he's came a, from Gnosticism. A great, great, did, maybe we talked about this, but the one purpose of God by Jan Bond is a great book on hmm. Augustine's yeah, uh, view on justice. Yeah. He was a, he was a, a reformed guy, Dutch guy. And uh, yeah, it was justice. It was uh, Augustine that first came up with the idea that justice was somehow different than love, yeah. that it was like this revenging justice, which just doesn't make sense in the Old Testament because you read the Old Testament it defines God's justice as his grace and his, his mercy. And then, yeah, when you get in the New Testament, it's the same word as righteousness. And we're to we're to forgive like our father in heaven yeah, well and it, it makes god like so erratic like yeah like he's yeah it just doesn't make sense that well and that's what people think freedom is so D- bentley hart does a great job of bringing out the idea that what most people mean by free will is chaos just it could be this it could be that um but it, a slug has that kind of freedom it can <laughs> slither left or it can slither Right. And so what I tell people is, and I, and I think this is good reformed theology. This is why I liked or Calvinism or reformed theology is they would say, if, if you're one of the chosen, if Jesus died for you, that means that you know. are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if he did, you are predestined for freedom. So I say to people, look, your freedom totally matters to God. If you define that correctly, but you also have to become like a little child and a little child is in the process of of learning what freedom is and no no loving father takes a two-year-old sets him down in the middle of the mojave desert and says you're free Good and luck. then drives away yeah yeah you, you know, that's just, that's brutal yeah no that's, that's evil that's good so i want to break this next section off into two uh what are the scriptures that you have seen that kind of turned your view um, and then more of a logical side to this. But I loved, I heard you on another podcast where you talked about how you see this in right up in Genesis, uh, Genesis yeah. one, two and three, that, that you, and I've, I processed that. I was at the gym when I was listening to you say that um, didn't have a Bible, but I really processed that. And I have always, I've always wrestled with that passage when, you know, of course, when people say God can't be around sin and I'm like, it's the first thing he did after the fall. Like he went to the garden that was sinful. And so tell me, uh, so go through the old Testament and then the new starting with Genesis where you just see this pattern. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, there were all, there were all these blatant verses in scripture, uh, particularly in Ephesians and, uh, Ephesians, and then Paul has blanket statements in Romans and, and Corinthians. And then I preached through the God, I preached through Matthew because I thought, okay, the, all these scary passages are in Matthew. And Matthew was just amazing. I mean, the things Jesus says and does are so cool. And yeah. the most terrifying passages just opened up. Once you really study them, you're like, oh, this is so great. I see what he's saying. And then I preached through the Revelation. Um, and Man, the revelation just knocked it out of the park. I mean, I got to the end where God's sitting on the throne. I said this to the church. This is five years before I'm defrocked. On the throne, he says, behold, um, I make all things new. These words are faithful and true. Write it down. And I remember I said to the congregation, I said, look, uh, I don't know how to explain that away anymore. So it's true. He makes all things new. And we went on. All means all. (laughs) Yeah, and all means all. I, I don't know how else you get around that right there and understanding space and time and the city and all that. So that's when I started getting in trouble. And uh, people from the denomination came, you know, and, you, and said, you need to stop doing this. And I thought, geez, what am I going to preach? It's not going to get me in trouble because now once I see you see it, stuff. you can't not. see yeah, it. Yeah, it's just like everywhere. So I thought, OK, I'll go back and preach Genesis again because I'd preached it years before. And I was a geology major. The age of the earth fascinated me and everything. So I went back and and I remember I'm preaching. I went, "Holy cow! Here it is, right at the start, in such a blatant way." And and this is what I mean. Um, I had always wrestled with the age of the Earth and geology and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had read a book by a physicist, Gerald Schroeder, that I thought was really fascinating. He just made this 
really interesting point. He, he said, you know, we know that space and time are relative now to this, the speed of light and gravity. Um, and, and he does these calculations. He says, uh, you know, in Genesis chapter one, there is no earth to stand on. So from what perspective is God talking about these days? And, he he says, well, if you if you ask the question, how old is the Earth from the standpoint of the background radiation, which is the mom is like the moment when matter is when light is released right after the Big Bang. Yeah, boom. Yeah, and you you redo you do all the calculations for relativity and everything. <laughs> he you know, and you can argue about whether or not these details are right, but he says if the if the Earth is uh, four point what is it now three point eight they say now billion years old or whatever, from the standpoint of Earth, if the universe is that old, if you ask that question from the standpoint of the background radiation, how old is the Earth? He said it's about six days, which all of a sudden takes care of all these scientific problems. But then when I went back and look at the text, I realized, oh, my gosh, it takes care of all these theological problems, mm. too, really, but in a more, much more beautiful way. And you don't need forget about all the science of it. If you just pay attention to the text of Genesis, it's really clear that the days in the first chapter, that, that when that when the author uses the word day, he's not using it the way we use it in a on our one of our calendars. In fact, in chapter two, there's a sentence where he uses it, the word day. He says, "Thus was the day that the Lord created the heavens and the earth." Well, he just said it was seven days, but then he said it's one day, and then he says, and then he refers to the day as the twelve hours of daylight. And if you take it literally, by the time you get to the second chapter he says it, the text starts when no let's see when no um plant was in the or when no shrub was in the field or whatever you go well that's that's the third day and then he starts creating adam people always postulate that there are these two creation stories but if you take if you think to yourself okay maybe the person writing this down wasn't an idiot whether it was moses or whatever <laughs> yeah they, they would have obviously anybody at that time who thought the bible wasn't written by idiots would think oh now we're talking about the sixth day because god is creating adam and once you let go of that weird the weird modern notion of time has to always fit in our calendars it becomes obvious that um you're back in the sixth day by chapter two, and you don't get to the seventh day until Jesus Christ, it is finished on the cross, which is at the end of the sixth day of the week, about the sixth hour of the day, sixth day of creation. Oh, man. And lo and behold, he's the door to eternal life. And he died. And now this is fascinating, too, because there are all these little things that make you go, pay attention, pay attention. He dies on a tree in a garden on Mount Zion, which the Jews believe was the site of of Eden. So anyway, back to the first chapter. At the by the end of the first chapter, everything is good and it is finished on the seventh day. And now, if if that was in the past, you got a real problem, and that is, how did evil ever get into the world get if in. everything was good yeah. and and it is finished on the seventh day? And well, that problem goes away if you realize God's creating Adam on the on the sixth day. It means that we haven't gotten to the seventh day yet. We don't get to the seventh day till we get there with Jesus. But there is this reality where everything is good and it is finished. And that day, that seventh day, is the whole Bible is about. Look, you're going through six. You're going to get to seven. Yeah, On seven, you're going to rest because I'm the creator and this is reality. And that seventh day is not like the other days. This is all throughout the text, too. It's eternal or ionios or outside of chronological time. So that's right there at the start, and then once you get into the, once you get into the text, um, the story of the fall then becomes part of the story of our creation. So if if your doctrine of, of well, this is the way we think about it in Western the Western Church, God made everything good. We screwed it up. Now we're just like, oh gosh, I hope there's some way He can pull this thing off, mm -hmm. and you know, and Jesus needs my help. But if you take it seriously. It's like the map of all reality is right there in chapter one. God's going to make everything good. He's going to do it. It's going to happen because that's his judgment. And then now we're back in chapter two, which I think starts in day three, but that's a longer story, <laughs> at least day six. And then what is the, so what is the, what is it that we're doing in this world? We're watching our own creation. And what's the point of that? Well, when I see what God has done, I will worship him endlessly. And that's where, 
And that's where scripture ends, that once you go into the new Jerusalem, which is like going into the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, yeah. which is representative of the coming age, it's just constant party. It's constant worship of who God is and great gratitude for what he's done. So I think that's, I wrote a couple books on it. I feel like I need to do a third one called The Tree in the Middle of the Garden, but that one really gets me excited. So I need to say this, Scott, because I, I, I neglect to sometimes. I'm so excited for the church to kind of embrace the idea that Jesus actually wins. Because once you do, all these complicated, confusing, problematic things in Scripture, well, they kind of go away. And suddenly Scripture, the whole, all of Scripture becomes beautiful, I think, painful. But we already knew that. We already knew that this world was painful. We already knew that we all have to die. But now all Scripture testifies this beautiful truth that, God is making us in his image and he won't fail. Yeah. I love that. And that, that was kind of a turning point for me. And I've said this in my sermons is one of the issues is in the Western theology, cause it's law based. We always think the first covenant was with Moses and yeah. uh, first covenant was with Abraham's for or, uh, Adam. And then I see other little ones, but really it was with Abraham. And yeah, that one struck me. Uh, and this hit me when I was going through this whole phase and, you know, everyone was getting on me and calling me a heretic. I actually went to Mexico and uh, I was on a beach and that verse came to my mind, you know, as the sand in the seashores and I'm on one beach on the planet earth and I'm looking yeah. and the Lord just spoke to me. He's like, how much sand is that? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? And so yeah. then I really started studying it and I see that where, where him and Abraham are making a covenant and Abraham just falls asleep and he wakes up and God's fulfilling the entire covenant. And I'm just like, yeah, doesn't that just scream God's going to finish the job or he's already, yeah. he's already finished the job. Doesn't it just yeah. scream that? And well, and you know what? So, and Paul talks about that tons in Romans. So I was just looking at all that again. Yeah. And it's so cool that, yeah, God just shows up to this uncircumcised pagan somewhere in Syria and says, uh, I'm going to bless you and all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed by you. And he says, you know, um, go to the land I show you. We forget Abraham was already on his way there. That's what Genesis says. So it's not like there's some huge thing he's asked to do, if yeah. anything. Go it's east. This un <laughs> it's this unconditional promise. And then, yeah, when he cuts the covenant, like in the next chapter, Abraham just goes to sleep. He watches God walk between the pieces. And, just, and he just says, I'm just going to do this. End of story. And it's the promise. Well, what's then was totally fascinating to me, and this is so like God, I guess. But after Abraham goes to the top of Mount Moriah, which you know is Calvary, and also picture the garden, and he goes to offer Isaac, and God provides the ram in his place. Then God says, He says, Because you have done this, surely I will bless you, which is like you're like, oh. Now you're saying that the promise is conditioned upon Abraham's obedience, obedience and yeah. his faith. Yeah. And it's like, and I, so when people say faith doesn't matter, I go, no, faith is everything. But what's the point of that story? It's that God can promise to Abraham he's going to do it 50 years earlier because God knows he's going to create faith in Abraham. He's going to do it. Um, God's going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So he says, yeah, you got to have faith, Abraham, but I'm going to create this faith in you <laughs> over these next 50 years. And I know what I can do. And in, in, uh, in Romans it's so cool. Cause Paul says, he says this stuff right at the start. And I had never really paid attention to it till I had to preach to it. And I'm staring at it. He says, uh, it, it's, I think it's in three. He says, God will, God, God will justify the uncircumcised. He will justify the uncircumcised through grace, and he will justify the circumcised through grace. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, so what? Are there any half? Are there any half not? circumcised yeah. ones out yeah, there? Yeah, that's what I thought. I go, dang, bar circumcisions are in trouble. Yeah, but yeah, so it's yeah, that story is so is you're totally right, and the and the covenant so fascinating too, because you, from the very start the the covenant is a covenant of grace. And then the law is part of the covenant of grace. Mm -hmm. Now this, this is really cool. Like Carl Bart points, points this out. I used to think all this stuff was nutty and I didn't pay attention to it. And now I think it's just so cool, but in the Holy of Holies, which is a picture of the seventh day, you know, the Jesus sits on a throne, which is the Ark of the covenant and the, and the covenant itself is those stone tablets of law, the old covenant, 
wrapped in the mercy seat, mercy which is seat. covered in blood. So it's like the old covenant is contained within the new covenant. It's part of telling the new covenant story, which if you're a dad, which you are, right? Mm -hmm. You know that. For your five-year-old, you make a bunch of rules. Like for my son, it was like, Coleman, you cannot eat dirt in the backyard because <laughs> he used to he used to like to eat dirt and i'd find him out there eating dirt <laughs> and, and you know i'm like it's just like it, it but i don't care whether he eats dirt i i, I just don't want him to you know, i want him to trust me yeah. that's my whole point i'm and I, i find him in the backyard eating dirt i go we have pizza inside buddy come inside and eat pizza well now that coleman is is grown up I, you know, he's he's 30 working on a PhD. I'll say, look, you can eat all the dirt in the backyard you want. I don't care. You do what you want. Because that 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 covenant of law was part of his part of his growing up. And I think the same thing is true in scripture. And if you remember the old testament story where they took the the cover off of the ark and they looked at the law in the within the within under the mercy seat and it killed him. It's like you you That'll kill you. It's designed to kill you. And then God will raise you from the dead. Yeah. And I think that was one of the, as you said, that was a huge one for me is in first Corinthians 15, when Paul's laying out as best he can, the chronological order of how this is going to go down. And what yeah. every, this again, a huge one for me is when what you just said, it says he will put all his enemies under his feet, which is all of us. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. we've yeah. Christians read that into like, well, I'm not under his feet. Like, yeah, I'm beside him. This is all the other people, but that's not what it says. And he will yeah. sit on his throne and judge. Well, yeah, that's a scary moment. But it's also like, what throne does he sit on? A mercy yeah. seat. That's what propitiation yeah. means. The mercy seat. And so, or, you know, in Romans 3 or whatever And, and it is. what is his, and the for me, the word judgment basically means decision. And his judgment is right there. The in chapter one, and that is, let us make humanity in our own image and likeness. So his well, judgment yeah. is, no, you cannot be a butthead anymore. You have to be my son. <laughs> and, and, that's the, that's... and Jesus, that was a, I love that part where he's like, now is the judgment of this world. Now. Yeah. Yeah. We always think right. it's in the future. He's like, no, it's the cross. The cross was God's yeah. judgment on the world that I forgive you. I mean. Yeah. And then, and at the end of that chapter in chapter 12, he says, and I know God's commandment, his commandment is eternal life. In other words, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to live eternally. Yeah. That's, I rose all so. of humanity from the dead, so you're coming with me. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> hey, guys, we hope you are enjoying this episode of the Zoo Town podcast. Um, we just want to take a moment right now to remind you that likes, shares, uh, reviews, they go a huge way as far as getting the message out further into our community, but also abroad and into other communities. So if you value this conversation and past conversations that you have heard on this podcast, we ask that you take the time to actually go and give us five stars. Don't give us four. We need all of them. And uh, leave us a review. Thanks again for being listeners to this podcast and contributors and joining the conversation. Well, and so yeah. another Old Testament one, I'll let you kind of comment on this. You know, Isaiah 45, it's such a, a, a crazy passage. I just preached on it a few weeks ago because uh -huh. it starts out with like King Cyrus, right? Like God chose, yeah. God chose uh -huh. a pagan to save you guys, right? And yeah. then it goes into, but God's the ultimate salvation. And then you get to Isaiah 45 where Paul quotes in Philippians, I think. And he's like, and every knee will yeah, bow, every tongue will confess and swear. Uh -huh. I love that part and swear allegiance to me. They will swear allegiance. Yeah. Now, when you swear allegiance to someone, you are on their side then, right? Yeah. And yeah. But we, I was trained in the Western theological view that like God, for his own glory or his own ego, I guess, yeah. is he's going to make people bow and then cast them back into hell just to like get it out of the way that you will bow to me. And I just that Isaiah 45, it's like, no, they'll swear allegiance. And when you swear allegiance, like you're either a Celtic fan or you're not. <laughs> and once, yeah. you, once you're wearing the green and white, like you're in. And so I think those passages in the Old Testament just constantly scream towards the redemptive quality oh, of Jesus. I think totally. I mean, verse 22, right before it says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. That's his command. And then he says, by myself, I have sworn. And you're going you're gonna to kneel and, and worship. But one of my favorite, so see, this is where, 
like I used to really hate the Old Testament, it just freaked me out. And now I really love it because I'm like, okay, this is so cool if I just take it seriously. So for me, the scariest verse in the Old Testament was Isaiah 66 about the worm never mm-hmm. dying and the fire and all that stuff. Until I thought, okay, I just got to read it and take it seriously. And what he says here at the end is he's, he says, from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. And all of Isaiah is about you worship. That's what it is to be saved. And then he says, and they, they is all flesh, shall go out and look on the dead bodies, the corpses of the men who have rebelled against me. Well, okay, that's weird. Who are the men that have rebelled against him? Well, you read Isaiah and you follow it all the way through. It's all humanity and the Messiah who's numbered himself with the transgressors or the or the rebellers. And then he says, for their worms shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be in abhorrence to all flesh. So <laughs> the picture is all flesh. All of us are standing there on the edge of the New Jerusalem, looking at our corpses in the Valley of Gehenna, praising God that we don't have to deal with that crap anymore because yeah. our old body is being consumed. I hate that guy. <laughs> and, yeah, and the, and the worm that doesn't die Jesus says he's a worm in Psalm 22 yeah, on the cross. And there are these worms in the Valley of Gehenna that they pupate. They make little chrysalises or whatever, and they fly away, turn into butterflies. And the fire that doesn't get, that consumes, like, well, that's, that's God himself. So the most terrifying passages, it, it turns out, well, what was I terrified of? I was terrified of what I already know is true. And that is that one day my body's going to turn to dust. But what is Isaiah saying? But I'll be praising God for that day in a in a new body with my new brothers and sisters um, in this new Jerusalem. And the Old Testament, like Zephaniah is a great one, too. He says, you know, one day the whole earth is going to be consumed in the fire of my jealousy so that everybody will praise me. But we don't like read those verses together because we, no. we think God's, that's, God's not capable of something like that. Well, and just think about what you said. That's, I've never heard that analogy. That's amazing uh, about the worms in Gehenna. Well, when a, a worm becomes a butterfly, it leaves its former shell behind, right? Yeah. yeah. And so mm-hmm. when Jesus is referring to that, and so, you know, Yes, this former flesh will be destroyed and eaten by worms, basically. Yeah. But your spirit will be like a butterfly, and we will be praising God because that flesh has done nothing but do us harm for our entire life. Well, and you know what's so funny, too, is your the flesh that you have now is totally different than the flesh you had 10 years ago. Your body cycles it through. So where is your flesh now? Well, it's, I don't know, you flush In the it toilet. down. The toilet. <laughs> yeah, it's on ditches and... So your body is like kind of like a waterfall in a sense that it's always it's always changing. And yeah, so it really is. The bad news is what we already knew. And the good news is is beautiful. And, you know, and I say to people, too, I say it's not that it's not that there isn't a Hades or an outer darkness. It's that God beats it and he beat he beats it by creating faith in you that he's the savior. So by creating fear in people that he might not save them well you're not helping people get out of the outer darkness mm-hmm. you, you're trapping them there because it's that ego that that traps us in that place yep well let's uh, obviously we could talk scripture all day it's like i yeah. said it's hard for people because and i get it i was there i i remember thinking about this 10 years ago um because of that one verse where it was like and it is god's will that all should come to repentance and the knowledge of the truth and i was like well, that kind of throws something in the face of my Calvinism for sure, because I believe God yeah. is sovereign and he always gets his will, you know, and it's it's amazing to watch people dance around that passage. Right. They do all those weird things about they've come up with a lot of big words defining this kind of will and that kind of will. And I'm like, OK, you're making all that up. That's not there in the text. No, I mean, we're, and we can go so deep into that, like even yeah. there, there's just normal human grace that God gives out. You know, and I'm like, yeah, is yeah. there different graces or is it just grace? You know, but uh, we could talk scripture all day. But I also I, I appreciate everything you said, because as a geologist and looking at a science, like there's a logical side to this, too. And unfortunately, because of certain passages saying you can't trust yourself or you can't trust your emotions and all that, which I actually believe are true. I think we've made that into you can't think about this stuff logically. And um, on my journey, that was one of the big ones is in Isaiah. People kept saying this to me when I would bring this up. They'd say, well, God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And they were using that in a way to justify him torturing people. 
And then I read that passage and that passage is all about God's grace. Like Mm -hmm. his grace, you haven't even begun to think about how big and how different his grace is, which we could say about justice too. Um, But that they use that verse as a way to not think, well, we can't think about this stuff because his ways are higher. And I'm like, so the higher way is torturing people, you know, like that's the higher way. So what's just, what are some logical things um, (laughs) that you have like just logically, why does this make more sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm just laughing just because people act like we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and strength, but none of our mind. Of our and mind, I'm yeah. like, what? yeah, that's just crazy. And so, um, yeah, the logic of it is just so, is just so profoundly simple. Um, so you could, I think you could say it in a whole lot of ways. And and I say to people too, they say, well, this is so complicated. This is all new. I don't know how to make sense of it. And I say, look, it's actually, I think, profoundly simple. What's complicated is all the weird lies that we have constructed around it, trying to explain it away. But maybe the very first is just to say, well, God is, I am that I am. He's the creator. He's all powerful. So it's like what you just said. If God wants to do something, he can do it. And if God wants to create faith in us. If faith is a thing, then he made it and he can do it and he'll do it the way he wants to. Um, so what we're saying is that God is a successful creator. So God doesn't, God doesn't, is not endlessly the way. Well, the, the, and this words are important because how this relates to space and time is important, but we, we've, we've constructed a view of God in which God is held captive and frustrated by his own lack of success for all eternity. Um, so if you postulate this place where God has to endlessly torture his own creation because they will not agree with him, well, God is endlessly a failure and endlessly mm-hmm. frustrated and endlessly angry, not at peace. <laughs> yeah, endlessly angry, which is all profoundly unbiblical. I think I think maybe a, a more accessible, that's a philosophical way to think about it, but I think probably a logic that's more accessible to most people is to simply say, now look, and and you have to say this to like our old crowd. You have to say, I did not come up with this, with this analogy. Um, And it's not an analogy. Jesus came up with it. He said to call him dad. That's what he said. And he didn't say it to Presbyterians. He said it to (laughs) a group of people on the hillside. None of them who knew the plan of salvation. One of them could have been Judas, probably some Romans. He said, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven. Now, Jesus is the truth. Can the truth tell me to lie? So he's saying to these people, he's your dad. And then Jesus is the one that makes all the, then Jesus makes a comparison. So he says, well, you know what a good dad is. If your kid asks you for bread, you wouldn't give him a stone. Uh, let me tell you a story about a dad who loved his two sons. Uh, well, this is, mm-hmm. and and he's the one that makes the analogy. Well, I you know, and I use, and people would do that. Well, his ways are different than our ways. And I go, uh, yeah, like in better than our ways. That's yeah. kind of like, that's kind of like the point is I have an idea of better. Jesus knows I have an idea of better. And he says, Peter, you know, good dads, bad dads. Our dad is the very, very best dad. And once I put, once I put God in that dad role and me in the kid role, which is called reality, then all of this theological stuff makes profound sense. And people say, oh, you're saying you don't need to, you don't need to fear him. And I'm like, oh no, when you're a five-year-old, the one guy you fear in the world is your dad. And that's because he loves you and he's not gonna, he's not gonna leave you alone if you have a good dad. If you have a bad dad, yeah, he might, but God's a good dad. So to me, that's the, that's the logic that God is a good dad that's able to, raise all of his kids and bring them home. And then I think you can talk systematic theology all day. And it, the, the idea of an endless hell is, is just, but doesn't match scripture. And it is illogical that, um, yeah. That, so oh. I, you know, I, I, I guess you could postulate in the end, if you get philosophical about it, we all have to take a leap of faith in some direction for sure. And, and we've already taken a leap of faith into the absurdity of being our own creation. <laughs> and so you, 
and and that's how we've come to know evil and now good has come to know us yeah one of the one of the analogies i like to use is one i mean i'm sure you've heard this but you know jesus tells us to forgive our enemies or else we're not forgiven yeah but, but he doesn't have to do that yeah so like that makes us better <laughs> than him and then on yeah. top on top of that how many times actually ty our executive pastor brings this up he's like how many times in the old testament does God say, I'm not like other gods. I'm not like other gods. I'm not like other gods. And then in the new, in, in Western Christianity, we've created a God that's worse than Zeus or like yeah. worse than yeah. Molech or worse than yeah. Baal. And I'm like, how can we yeah. go from, I'm not like other gods to he's basically like all the other gods that the nations yeah. were surrounding there. And that, that just doesn't logically make sense to me. And, and the second one too, it's just the, you know, it's like having, you you know revelation i hold the keys to death and hades right so he, yeah. let's all agree on this podcast he holds the keys <laughs> and yeah that's like saying there's this big party going on he jesus throws a house party right and the uh -huh. good ones are upstairs and we're partying i mean we're we're drinking that new wine but downstairs there's a bunch of people locked in the basement and it's on fire that that yeah. basement's on fire and we're totally cool partying upstairs knowing this. And the one who holds the keys can't do anything about it. <laughs> yeah. Be, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. That just doesn't make yeah. any sense to me. Well, and, and a lot of, and this, a lot of the old terrifying passages now for me become really fascinating when you look at them logically. So like the idea of the unforgivable sin, that's a freaky idea, right? Yeah. But when you really look at it, seriously you go well there's only one thing that jesus says won't be forgiven and that's when i refuse to forgive so unforgiveness itself is the unforgivable sin and i go but but that doesn't mean that it that when i forgive something if i if you if you steal 30 bucks and i find out i go ask god i forgive you the 30 bucks it means you can keep the 30 bucks yes if i don't forgive you it means you're going to give me that 30 bucks and what i think jesus is saying is look if you're going to come to the party, there's one thing you're going to have to give, and that's forgiveness. You're going to have to just let all the crap go if you want to join the party. But if you, you know, if you want payment, if well, you can weep and gnash your teeth out there for a time. But in but in the end, even that will come to an end because I'm I'm going to end it. So yeah, yeah the, the, all these all these conundrums that people wrestle with in evangelical Christianity, like the unforgivable sin. That once I allow for the idea that God forgives everyone, what we have, yeah, what we have done is said, oh, well, now we have to find a way that God doesn't forgive certain people. No, the problem is he forgives everyone, and you will not enjoy heaven hanging out with a guy who forgives absolutely everyone if you're oh, hanging yeah. on to grudges and resentments. And When I heard you um, say that in a podcast, actually, that I love, because I believe the prodigal son story is like a hinge story. Like, he's laying yeah, out exactly what yeah. it's about. and. Obviously, you go down the whole track, but, you know, the, the boy comes home, the father doesn't say anything or let him say anything, and then he kills the fattened calf. So to me, that's the cross. Like, you're already yeah. forgiven, now let me prove it to you. But we've made this into a transaction, and that's why we don't, we, we don't believe everyone's forgiven. Even though the guy lowered on the mat, he, he didn't ask for it. Jesus just announced it over him. The woman caught in adultery just announces it over him. But we've made this into such a transaction. But you said something then. That blew my mind. I actually run, ran to my staff and told it because I love the prodigal son story. You, there, I've always wondered why that story just ends, right? And yeah, I've heard you know I've read commentaries and Calvinists and all that, and it's just kind of like, well, you know, he he just wanted us to think about it. But what you said was it's interesting that the person he's hanging outside the party with, the last person, by the way, in the community, was the older religious brother who didn't like that his brother was forgiven. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy, man. That's crazy you said that because I've never thought of that. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. What I think uh, guy, Kenneth Bailey wrote a great book on the parables and he kind of talks about that. But yeah. And and then this is a wild thought that the father's not saved either. So the father's in the outer darkness with the older brother. So by the older brother forgiving his younger brother, he's saving his father. And one thing that's been really wild for me is praying with people struggling with demonic abuse and stuff in the back and the or sexual abuse and demonic really freaky stuff yeah and 
the thing that has amazed me is that Jesus is always there with them in these frightening, terrifying memories. And and that by going back and helping them forgive their the perpetrator or forgive God for the thing that happened to them, it's not only they that get to leave the outer darkness where they're stuck, but Jesus is there with them. So, I mean, that's a wild thought, but he he bears, he actively bears our sin and sorrow. Like he bore it once on the cross, and yet the cross is the point where eternity touches time, all temporality passes through that cross and in the story of the prodigal son yeah it's god himself that's standing there in the darkness with that older brother and jesus is talking to a whole bunch of older brothers that are about to crucify him because he was nice to the gentiles and, yeah that's so interesting because then in that made me look at other passages when you said that like how you know the weeping and gnashing of teeth it yeah. we have been told that like god's not there but like yeah. I, Isaac the Syrian and all those guys were like, well, rest assured, whoever's outside the kingdom, Jesus is there with them. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And yeah. there's even, I mean, there's so many passages, right? When he's like, well, the prostitutes and tax collectors, they'll get in before you. That, that, yeah. that means they'll get in. He's just yeah, like, right. He's just like, well, they're going to get it way before you. <laughs> well, I, th you know, I think, yeah, and it's all over the place, but we read those and I do this, you know, and I've been a pastor a long time and I believe, and I actually believe this stuff some of the time, Yeah, yeah. but, but I read scripture with my shame and guilt. And the first place I go is, oh shit, I'm in trouble. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know if I can say that on a podcast, uh, it's fine. but, but that's, what's going down, down in, in my heart. And then it's like, God has to pull me back to it and go, okay, Peter read slower. Um, and and lo and behold, he's there with me. It's it's not that it, it's not that I my problem is that I relish the darkness. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I'm the one wishing it on myself, and Jesus is always saying, "Hey, have we had enough of this? Could we go out into the light now?" Well, and logically too, just to stick on this, it's like you're either you either believe that in the end that destruction is going to save the world, right? destruction yeah. is going to save the cosmos if you read revelation that way and it's like god man he gave this grace thing a pretty fair shot but we destruction is going to bring peace and that's exactly how the world thinks that's exactly yeah. how the flesh thinks that's exactly how you know we think we're going to make peace with russia by a war and it just never ever ever makes peace and yeah so you either believe that or the other side is jesus is the ultimate winner like, yeah, he's not going to lose and he's not running out of time and grace is going and love is going to save, save it all. I mean, there's, it's either yeah. one or the other, you know? Okay. So you, you don't have to leave. Can I tell you a story? You don't have to leave this in the podcast. Oh, I'd love to. to. You're great. Well, but praying with this friend of ours all these years. Um, and, and, you know, and I, I it, you shouldn't believe everybody that tells you a weird story, but, um, <laughs> I've been married to my wife now for. Gosh, how long has it been since I guess it doesn't matter. It's been almost 40 years, but I've I I've just learned to trust her. And she'll have these words of knowledge from God and she'll see visions. And I and she would pray with me for this old friend. And in this friend, the, we prayed with her for years. And after seven years, Satan himself started manifesting. I mean, it was just the freakiest, weirdest mm -hmm. stuff. I and and, and this is not subtle. I mean, this is, the kind of, this is the creepiest stuff. And this one night, we had discovered how he had gotten into her and what he was doing. We were about to cast him out. And we had communion wine and bread. And I mean, it's so cool because God uses this stuff. But anyway, um, he, she was cowering in the corner of my office. And she's not aware of what's going on. This voice is speaking to her. And I was just so angry. I, mean, I was just so angry at evil because it's just it's so evil. And I remember I said, I said, Jesus wins, doesn't he? And in this agonizing voice as he's leaving, I hear him say, Jesus always wins. And then he was gone. No way. And then she, and then, and then she's back and we're, we have communion and stuff. And I just remember sitting there and this was while all this was going on. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, Jesus, do you, do you always win? And at the time I was preaching through the revelation and I'm looking at the revelation, I'm looking at this, and I'm going, you do always win, mm -hmm. even when you lose, even <laughs> when you lose, you win. So when you get to the revelation, I wrote a book on the revelation years ago, and we re-preached through it, and we have these PDFs we'll put out on the website. 
but the revelation is so cool when you pay close attention to it. So like in chapter six, the kings of the earth and everyone runs and hides themselves under the earth and the rocks under the earth. Yeah. They're running from a slaughtered lamb. A slaughtered <laughs> lamb. He's already dipped in blood. Lamb. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, okay, that's just funny. It's like, it doesn't even say the lamb is chasing them. And then when he pours it, when they pour out the bowls of wrath on the earth, if you pay attention, what's in the bowls of wrath? Well, it's lamb's blood. It's what we drink at communion mm -hmm. every Sunday. Um, but the point is that, you know, if you if you hate love, well, love is going to burn you. And then by the end of the book. So so I think what the revelation is saying is this stuff is going on all the time. There are famines all over the world. There are earthquakes or destruction. We're all got to go through it. We all got to face death. And yet God is using all of that to glorify his son and bring us home to himself mm. until that day that we all enter the, the, the new day. Jerusalem, <laughs> which is coming down. Yeah. Till we enter into the new creation. Oh man. That's so good too. Cause yeah, that's how I view it. The, you know, you got the lamb. Okay. You got Jesus on a white horse and his robe is dipped in blood before the battle, before yeah. the battle. And then the word, the sword comes out of his mouth. And I mean, that's the gospel. That is the gospel. Right. Yeah. And then, Right after that, it's like they all the all the world gathers at Armageddon, slaughters everything, and the blood is higher than the horse's bridle. Well, that's obviously yeah. you know that's physically impossible, but also it just means everything was covered by the blood of the lamb. Well, it, it covered uh, yeah. everything. Yeah, that's what's so funny because then blood takes on this new meaning, right? And in that in that when he when he rides out on the white horse, he slaughters all flesh. People like miss that the but flesh, it's really clear flesh. all the kings of the earth and all flesh and then you go to the next chapter and the kings of the earth are walking in they're the back new Jerusalem. yep yeah so you're like okay he just like circumcised the earth mm -hmm. i think so that's that's uh that's pretty cool and i think that's happening kind of all the all time all the time yeah so, it's reciprocal yeah yeah so i want to end yeah. this last part just with your you're going through a series on romans right now um and I love I love some of the things you said just because Romans is such a a wonderful book but so misused and like you said I love that you were saying people always end at chapter 8 you know like of course the Calvinists love Romans 3 I mean everything's about Romans 3 and he's building this case along the way so how tell me just about the book of Romans like what what have you seen yeah. in that book and and how how is this and excited you because i'll be honest with the book of romans has not really excited me uh until about after nine <laughs> yeah right. uh, but i also yeah. want to take the full counsel of god so what what in romans do you see paul doing well okay so um yeah i'm i'm kind of mystified by what people do with romans so you know they all say take the romans road and i'm like have you even ever read the book of romans um, but even early on, so like now this is chapter three. So listen to this verse. This, this, and everybody quotes this. The righteousness of God through the, and if you translate it, I think well, it's like the King James, is through the faith of Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. That's chapter three. Right there at the start, he just said it. Um, all have sinned and fallen short and all are justified and the word justified means made right made right yep. you, you're you're judged right declared right made right then he goes on just a little bit further and he says god is the one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith well that's now we're only at the end of chapter three and then he gets on into chapter five and now it's just like insane i mean now he's he says stuff like Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so will one act of righteousness lead to justification and life for all men. For us, by the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. By the one man's obedience, many are made righteous. And then, and then he responds to that by going, okay, I know some of you are going to say, shall we sin that make grace may abound? He says, no way, you're not getting it if that's the case. And then he just keeps going until he's in you know, chapter 8, what can separate us from the love of God or whatever. And then he deals with objections like, okay, well, what about the Jews? What about this? What yeah, about yeah. that? So then he, he goes on and says, and so all Israel will be saved. And, and then he goes on to say, and so all humanity will be saved. And then he goes and, you know, and then he says, and the point of the whole thing, is that you present yourself a living sacrifice. And then he starts talking about how we're to treat each other because of this. And then he quotes Isaiah 45, 
Um, in chapter 14, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So I, I honestly am a little bit mystified how people could read the book of Romans and come to a different conclusion. And I think this is my theory. Well, in all fairness, we did. We did for years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Right. But, but I was always confused by Romans. You know what I mean? When I was, so, so when I was in college, I went to this barn fellowship thing and they, you know, in college, everybody's challenging everybody to be more spiritual than the next guy. So we had to, we had to memorize this so only up until that. Well, I haven't memorized tons of the Bible, but it, it's the one long chapter, long, long chapter of scripture that I memorized. So I memorized Romans eight. And when I'd be stressed, I'd try to read, recite it to myself. And there are big parts of Romans eight that I'm like, I, I just don't get how this fits with what everybody says about Romans. And when I go back to Romans and read it, it's always really puzzled me until I said, you know what? He makes all things new. And then I read it in that light. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, there it is again and again and again. So I think my theory is that because Romans is a, is kind of, is Paul's most systematic theology and it has uh, uh, probably the most technical language in it, though I'm not sure it was technical for the people that first read it. It's maybe the easiest for evangelists to to go back, pull a verse out here, a verse out there, say things that are partly true, and then twist it around and say it's dependent on you. And it's fascinating kind of digging into the translation to see how tenuous really so much of, mo of so many of the modern translations are. So it felt like the King James was a little more stressed about some of the things modern some of the things modern translators do. But but a, a big, for instance, is there are several places where Paul will talk about, you know, you know we're justified by uh, by faith in Jesus. But what Paul says, I think, is fairly clearly faith of Jesus. Oh, and yeah. you get into all these technical arguments about grammar, but the way he uses the the grammar and other parts of the book align with that. And the whole logic of the book aligns with that. So Paul's huge thing that he comes to over and over again is so you can't boast. So in other words, if you have faith and you feel proud about your faith. Well, that's not faith. You don't get it yet. Um, so we use Romans, um, I think, kind of like the way we, well, we use it like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We go to it and we cherry pick little pieces out of it um, and then readjust them in order to construct a, a narrative where I am presented with a bunch of supposedly logical assertions and then I make an informed decision, which saves me. And I can kind of be proud of it because I see it. And those idiots out there, you know, yep. that voted for that other guy, they don't see it. And um, which is ironically exactly the opposite of Paul's point, which, mm -hmm. which, by the way, you always have to remember who's writing this book. Well, it was a legalistic, arrogant, religious Pharisee who God just knocked on his can on the road to Damascus. Knocked off and, his ass, as I like to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, knocked him off his ass and opened his eyes and said, I'm choosing you. And by the way, you're the worst of all. Or, well, I, Jesus didn't say that to yeah, him, but yeah. Paul says that. He says, you know, people get, that's, that's what drives me crazy. People get so stressed about this because they say, oh, are you saying Judas could be saved or Hitler could be saved? And I go, well, yeah, but they're not the worst sinners. Do you know who the worst sinner in the history of the world is? It's in your Bible. And if you believe the Bible, it's Paul. Paul says, I'm the chief of all sinners. And that's why God and that's why God chose me. And I think that's what Romans is is testifying to when you follow the theology. Yeah, I mean, because Paul was directly coming against the movement of the spirit of the church. I mean Oh yeah, that's as bad and as he it knew, gets. <laughs> and he knew the Bible backwards and forwards, and he's dragging people off to their, to their death, and, yeah. and he's offended by grace. But and see, and but that's why, I, I think, this is why the message is so important. Is it, it it really causes you to go back and examine your heart? And I mean, it does this for me all the time because I'm like, God, I, I'm not done with my flesh. My flesh is. I'm still always wanting to exalt myself and to, to come face to face with the grace of God literally undoes a person. Mm -hmm. And that's, like I said, at the beginning, that's what's 
So interesting to me as I've laid this message out the last three years, and I've done it imperfectly too. Um, and um, yeah, it's difficult to wrap your thoughts around some of this sometimes because you have your uh -huh. own ego, you have pressure from other people. I mean, loved ones, all kinds of stuff. But after the planting, the fruit I'm seeing is just unbelievable in people. Like the love they have for people, the love, the freedom that they're having from their sin. I mean, it's the grace has exposed and healed people. That's what it does. Yeah. And we've made it the opposite. Like we think grace is like a shame thing. And if you don't receive grace, then, and I, I'm sorry, man, the more I've looked at fundamentalists compared to universalists, it's night and day on how their demeanor is towards the world, yeah. towards God, towards just people in general. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think that's really true. Um, yeah. so how do you, I want to end with one question cause you're going through Romans, just like there is a lot of wrath talk in Romans. Yeah. Um, yeah. Romans one sets it all up, but I've always found Romans one interesting. Cause then in Romans two, he's like, <laughs> therefore, why are you guys doing this? You know? So, um, yeah, what's, Romans one is so awesome. Uh, uh so what's your, yeah. you can talk about Romans one and then like, what's your just view of the wrath of God then? And the vengeance yeah, of so, God. Yeah. So, so real quick, um, Paul does such a great, uh, such a fascinating thing in Romans is he just kind of starts into this conversation and he, he, uh, he builds on all these sins that he knows, he knows are going to be controversial and they're in the, the big sin on homosexuality, you know, the big verses on homosexuality in Romans one, he, he brings is Romans one and he brings it up in Rome where you have two very different cultures. You have a Roman culture where yeah, you keep a boy on the side if you're married. That's, that's yeah. just that's just normal. And on the other side, you've got um, Jews that like if you know there's sexual immorality, you go kill that person. Mm -hmm. So how exactly they're going to deal with that in the Church of Rome? It's got to be really controversial. So he says some real controversial things. He draws people out like, okay, judge this, judge this, judge this, and then chapter two, verse one, and. The divisions, you know, are put a thousand in a thousand years after. Yeah, the text they read written. the whole book. <laughs> yeah, they just read it. The next line is um, th because though they knew God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. He's got your blood boiling. And then he says this. Therefore, you have no excuse, oh man, every one of you who judges <laughs> from passing judgment or another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. And then he goes on to start talking about grace. So they're the, the really, I, grace is everything, but we're not aware of it until we think that we can somehow pay. And I think that's part of what our story of walking through space and time is about. And when God reveals his wrath upon our arrogance, um, it sets us up for grace. So the message of the, 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 the greater our sin, the greater our concept of our sin, the greater will be the concept of God's grace. So in chapter five, he says, um, you know, where sin increased grace abounded all the more. In other words, God has a purpose for this sinful world. Yeah. Even and for sin. the, yeah. yeah. He's, he's revealing his heart and his, and his nature. And I, so then, okay, so now talk about God's wrath. So, boy, there's, there's a long topic, but I think it makes sense once you put it in this context. Um, my, my son Coleman, uh, <laughs> who's kind of the wild one, when he was in college, driving home from CU one day, he was driving too close behind this other car, a drunk driver. He flipped the UE or something. Coleman slammed into him with my truck, wrecked my truck. And he came to me and he was just, you know, so, so sad and, and felt so bad. And I was just glad he was alive. And, and I forgave him. I said, that's okay, Coleman, you don't have to pay me back for the, for the truck. And I, I, I just shared how I was really glad it happened because I wanted to show Coleman that he matters more than my truck. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that. And that I love him. And that and that was like the most powerful thing, the most effective, greatest gift for me to be able to show my son that in a moment. So what was it that what was it that Jesus showed us on what did God show us on the cross? Well, we wrecked dad's truck. And he said, 
I'm doing this for you. I, I, if, I, if I was all powerful and all knowing, I would arrange for Coleman to wreck my truck. Do I want him to keep wrecking my truck every time I get a truck for him to borrow it and wreck it? No, I don't want him to. But I want to reveal my, my love for him. Um, there's this fast, that fascinating line in the Lord's Prayer when Jesus says, pray, Father, lead us not into temptation. And we say, well, why would God lead us into temptation? Well, I think God arranges for us to crash the truck. Um, and <laughs> once we crash it, he's like, okay, now, could you just ask me not to have to do that again? Once you believe my love for you, don't don't keep crashing. Don't keep crashing the truck. Once, once you see that you crucified my heart on a tree in a garden. You don't need to do it again. Um, so what is the wrath of God? Well, in Romans, Paul says the wrath of God is revealed against the ungodliness of men who suppress the truth in the chains of their own unrighteousness. So what is God's wrath um, against? Well, he's a, God's wrath is directed against anything that would separate me from his love. And what is it that separates me from his love? My ego. That belief that I save myself, that I justify myself, that I create myself. So if I think that I am my resume, if I think that I am my ego, well, I'm going to experience the wrath of God. But God's going to reveal to me in the process. But that's not you, Peter. You are not your resume. You are not your own ability to accomplish things and get a degree and impress the people at church. You are my son, who I love absolutely, and um, I hate, I hate your sin. I'm saving you from your sin. So, is it real anger? I, I would go. Well, I'm a dad. Gosh, if anything makes me angry, it's something my kids would do, where they would doubt my love for them, hmm. or high, or high. You know, I think the thing that, like, thinking about my own kids. Whenever my kids would lie to me, that would just infuriate me. But not because, I don't think so much because they disrespected me, but because I lost them. I, you know, once, once they started living in the shadows, I lost them. And then I would need to figure out how I, how I go get them. So I think the wrath of, the wrath of God, someone said, wrath is the fluid that love bleeds. And I go, yeah. God is madly, furiously, relentlessly in love with you. And if you separate yourself from him, he's that gets him angry because, because he loves you. So um the I think I think probably because I had a really good dad, the wrath of God always made sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I think if you have a a father that doesn't really love you, it's a bit you know what? But remember what Jesus said in the Gospels. He said, "I'll tell you who to fear. Fear him who has the, what the power to, um, destroy your soul and cast you into Gehenna. Gehenna or Haiti, whatever." Yeah. Yeah, it's Gehenna. And and I say to people, "Well, okay, that makes sense to me. I mean, when my kids were little, I, I would, if I, you know, I'd find ways to say this to them. I'd say, look, look at me.'" I don't want you to fear the kids on the bus. I don't want you to fear what the neighbors say. I don't want you to fear um, the people down the down the street. There's there's only one thing you need to fear, and that's me. And now I'm telling you, have no fear. I love you. So, <laughs> it, it, that so fear is the beginning of wisdom, says Scripture, and Jesus is wisdom. But perfect love casts out fear. Yep. So, when I fear God, I'm fearing perfect love, and I go, well, that makes sense. Is there's one thing I want my kids to fear. It's me until they see that I'm, I'm ready to die for them. And, and I go, well, that's exactly what God, God does. Pay attention to me. Pay attention to me. Look, here's my heart nailed to a tree for you. And that's my judgment. It's never going to change. My judgment is eternal. There's no way you're going to get around the fact that I love you. Hmm. Yeah. And that's a good way to put it. Cause it's like, why do you want your kids to fear you and not other people? Cause other people will hurt them and abandon them and try yeah. to shape them into something that they're not. But if you fear your dad, then that fear is like, he will never abandon me. He's never going to try to make me something I'm not. He, you know, and I think that's, yeah. a, that's the healthy fear of dad, you know? Yeah. And then dad says, now look, don't be afraid. Let's have, let's, yeah. let's now have that one. you're here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, and, and yeah. So 
I think that's I think that's the wrath of God, and I think that is borne out throughout Scripture. And um, you know, if if you're walk into the wrath of God, I guess that's why it's when when people are getting ready to die, the thing I always want to say to them is, look, just run to Jesus. Don't run away, even if he's scaring you, you because the truth. The truth is he is the truth. And so whatever lies you hang on to are going to get ripped away in his presence. <laughs> so do it now. <laughs> um, yeah. So just get rid of all that stuff now. And and then when you see him, just call on him, run to him because because he loves you. That's good, man. Well, Peter, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Before you go, tell us what books you've written so our audience can read some of your stuff, brother. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah. So the 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 two that i i get most excited about are probably on genesis the the first one is called the history of time and the genesis of you which is on chapter 1 um the second one we kind of have two versions of each is called uh god and his sexy body but we changed the title <laughs> to god and his body because people were stressed about the sexy part of it but that's out of uh genesis chapter 2 then i have a, a little book that you can get online too that's that is um called all things new what the bible really says about hell then uh, older i have a book on the sermon on the mount that was th that were published by christian publishers back before i got defrocked um, <laughs> one is called dance lessons for zombies that's on the sermon on the mount and then i have a commentary on the revelation that's called eternity now um, but on our website we'll put out a pdf version that we preached a little while ago that's that's better the other one was hardback the website is um www of course dot relentless dash love dot org so relentless dash love dot org um where we have a lot of materials and people can find out stuff then the church website is the sanctuary denver dot org so that's that's a lot of stuff but yeah awesome. man I, it's it's, uh, it's such an honor to talk with you scott i feel like now i need to turn around and ask you all the same questions oh no that's why we do this i'm yeah. very, very well, thankful uh, for you your story is pretty pretty amazing yeah well honestly thank you thank you for being brave and paving the way for guys like me who are able to talk about it uh i can't say that it's as well received like you say uh but there is a change happening people are listening people are thinking people are open to this um yeah and it came from guys like you who were willing to follow christ even if it meant losing their mega church so yeah i'm, I'm thankful for you man yeah. thank you for listening to the, the voice of jesus and thank you for just coming on this show oh thank you scott all right god bless you brother okay you too right. bye